This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Just uh, to, to explain uh, the title, uh, Gravity, okay, well, I think we kind of all know what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, the subtitle, An Exercise in Quantization, is, is meant to uh, illustrate that um, what I, I mean by the output of that, which would be quantum gravity, is something that is kind of well-defined, uh, although you might have to work really hard to achieve the goal. So uh, this is what, what I mean by that. For me, this is the problem statement of quantum gravity. Uh, <clears throat> so quantum gravity is a theory uh, that is required to satisfy you know, some properties. Um, and uh, you know, Sabina and Robert have talked about uh, uh, requirement of agreement with uh, uh, experiments. Um, and uh, the, the fact that we, have, we lack direct uh, experimental evidence that would guide us. Uh, I totally understand that. So what I take as constraints are, is the physics that we already know. So it's echo, echoed in uh, Robert's talk in the uh, previous session. So here are the constraints. So first of all, it has to be quantum theory. Okay? And one has to define what the quantum theory is. It involves some non-commutative algebra observables and representations thereof, um, which are similar to states. Uh, it, ha it should have a classical limit. Okay, in the classical limit, you should have a classical mechanical system, which is uh, defined in some, in, uh, you can say, by Poisson algebra, uh, functions on the symplectic manifold. Uh, and moreover, this classical limit should be general relativity. One could relax that. You say, okay, well, I want the limit to be general relativity with some specific matter content. Okay, this is flexible. Uh, it should be a field theory. Okay, so it, it's a special kind of classical mechanical system uh, that has some properties that it's formulated on a continuum manifold. Uh, it uh, satisfies some properties of locality and causality. And uh, also, as an in incarnation of Occam's razor, uh, this theory should be minimal. Minimal in the sense that it does not have any uh, spurious degrees of freedom. Uh, deg so degrees of freedom that we have not observed um, you know, by looking at, uh, at the universe. So for example, uh, if we could formulate a theory that satisfies all these properties, uh, and moreover only has the degrees of freedom which are the metric for gravity, and say the standard model fields, maybe some extra fields that, uh, that uh, describe uh, uh, the, the, the matter uh, responsible for inflation and dark matter, then I would say that this is a minimal theory because it doesn't have anything else in it which we haven't seen. Okay? Uh, so the main point of my talk is that this definition is non-vacuous. There is an actual example, and it's fa actually fairly well known, but some people refuse to take it as seriously, I think, as it should be. Um, so, and the, the example is essentially the, so this is the technical term, deformation quantization of the classical field theory of GR, um, which is a, a somewhat uh, more precise mathematical version of saying that we take general relativity and quantize it in a canonical way. Uh, although I don't necessarily mean by canonical, it has to do with uh, the same thing that Klaus was talking about uh, with a, a preferred three plus one decomposition. Um, <clears throat> and this, this, uh, this quantization of GR is known to exist, at least perturbatively, okay? Uh, and it's used every day by cosmologists who are trying to analyze the, uh, well, trying to build models of the early universe simply by including fluctuating dynamical gravitons in their models. Okay, <clears throat> uh, it, and I believe that it's plaus plausible that this theory could also exist non-perturbatively although we don't have a way of defining it at the moment or checking that statement. Um, and other people would disagree with that. I mean, they have the, their reasons, and that's something to be argued about. But this is an important point um, to keep in mind. But I will mostly concentrate on the fact that we can construct this theory formally or perturbatively. So did you have a question? So I would say that they're not minimal because they contain so many other fields that we haven't observed. So they're higher modes of the strings. Uh, I don't want to be too specific here, but I mean, we, we have uh, some field theories that we understand quite well, like QED, for example, and uh, uh, it satisfies some properties that have been codified even ax uh, axiomatically, uh, a la Weitman or Har Kassler or Brunetti Fredenhagen Berg. And those are the kind of properties I'm talking about. But they have fixed light form structure. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, we have a fixed light form structure in the algebra. Okay, so. So if you're, uh, 
So, GR classically is well defined. And in G classical GR, you can define all these things. In fact, I wrote a paper about this. So, <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not standard. I mean, this is, uh, uh, I mean, there, there's some things that are well known in PD theory about uh, locality, causality problem, uh, properties of Einstein's equations. Um, and if you translate them into the algebraic language, uh, where algebraic field theory lives, then uh, they generalize the properties of microcausality and, and so on. So there is a version of these properties that do generalize to gravity. And I believe that if, uh, well, uh, once you have them in the classical theory and you perform deformation quantization, which is a kind of quantization, they survive through the quantization process. And whatever the output of the process is, that will be the notion of continuum locality and causality for the quantization of GR. Okay, unfortunately, I will not be able to be very technical in this talk because I wanted to cover quite a number of subjects and uh, with the time restrictions it will be difficult. Um, okay, so here's a sketch of the construction that I claim exists, right? Start with the Einstein-Hilbert action on a four-dimensional manifold. Okay, then you construct a, a classical field theory. What do I mean by that? Uh, we take the solutions to the field equations, possibly imposing boundary conditions as needed, and that, will, that space will be called, will, will be our phase space. And uh, it's related, because of the well posedness of initial value problem, it's related to the usual canonical phase space in terms of initial data. That space uh, is an infinite dimension manifold, but uh, it has a pre-symplectic structure. So it's al almost symplectic up to the fact that we can uh, apply gauge transformations, which live in the kernel of the symplectic form. Uh, but, and the gauge transformations are diffeomorphisms, four dimensional space time diffeomorphisms. After this space is quotiented by the action of the gauge group, uh, so we end up with just a collection of orbits of the gauge group, uh, that's a new space, and this will be the physical phase space. And the pre symplectic structure will turn to symplectic structure, which means that there will uh, there'll be a Poisson structure, which means that the functions on that space will be our obs observables, invariant under gauge transformations, and there'll be Poisson bracket on them. Okay, it's very quick, but this is the construction of the classical field theory. Uh, and once we have the classical field theory, we build the quantum field theory, uh, which means that <coughs> we apply a certain procedure called deformation quantization uh, to this classical theory, and ma making sure, as I mentioned, to uh, take the, the, the formulation of locality and causality for the classical theory and make sure that they, they survive in the quantization. So, sorry, it's yeah. not guaranteed that the physical phase space will be a manifold, though, is it? Well, okay, so this is a bit of a technical thing, but I mean, it's a topological space. Uh, and it is actually known that away from, um, well, uh, it's almost a manifold with a few exceptions. So for highly symmetric metrics are conical singularities. But I mean, we, uh, we can deal with conical singularities as well. So it's a technical difficulty, not a conceptual one, I would say. Okay. Um, Right, and uh, so this procedure you might have noticed is, is uh, uh, not unique to GR. I mean, I could have started with uh, some other functional, uh, action functional here, and you know, just apply this procedure, which is field quantization. None, none other than that. People have been doing it for decades. It's just that, you know, uh, what, what I wrote down is a sketch of a more, slightly more precise version of what physicists do. Um, and once you specify precisely what needs to be done, you can ask the technical or mathematical question, whether you know, all the steps work? And uh, the answer is yes. Up to uh, a big elephant in the room. So uh, <clears throat> this, this step, the deformation quantization, uh, it's known how to do it perturbatively in h-bar. Okay? Uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, uh, clear. Um, it is not known how to do it non-perturbatively in h-bar, okay? And this is not known for GR, but it's also not known for all the interesting quantum field theories that comprise the standard model. So if one were to um, you know, bring up this point and say, oh, well, you've built GR, but it's, not, it's only perturbative. And if you declare that, so a failure, you also have to admit that the standard model fails in the same way. So I just want to make sure that Sorry? Uh, yeah, I agree. 
but uh, uh, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have that's a, it's a conjecture definition. So we don't know how the limits behave, you know, when you take the lattice size, uh, lattice spacing to zero. So that's part of the elf in the room. Uh, and there's actually one million, you know, uh, uh, mathematics prize, one million dollar mathematics prize for the solution to this problem. So I would say that this problem is unsolved for both GR and the standard model. I just want to make sure that when standard, they're on the same level in this, at this criticism, system, right? So I will mostly concentrate on the formal aspects. Okay. Um, so here's my list of reasons uh, why general relativity is hard. So why this exercise of quantization is difficult applied to GR, okay? Um, and uh, <clears throat> but the main point I want to make is that all of these reasons, which I'll quickly run through, um, appear in GR, but they also appear in other contexts, in other field theories, okay? And in, for, for most of them, um, when they occur in isolation, we have a good idea or in how to handle them, okay? Of course, it's, it's not the universe. I mean, some problems are really hard and you have to solve them really case by case. But there are some cases where we know what to do. And um, uh, the challenge for general relativity is to put all of these things together, okay? My claim is that uh, there's uh, each of these, uh, that we actually know how to do this at the level of the perturbative quantization of general relativity. Um, and uh, this is unfortunately not so well known. So my talk is, a, is a, in a way a bit of an advertisement for that. Uh, on the, one slide after this one, I'll list some other challenges that people perceive in GR, and I'll make a claim that those are perceived problems once you look at the construction method seriously. Um, and I'll get back to that. But these, I think, are real mathematical challenges that need to be solved. So, nonlinearity. General relativity is a nonlinear field theory. We know how to construct linear field theories, but it's not the only one. There are very basic examples, lambda phi 4 theory, QED, uh, with the coupling between fermions and electromagnetic fields, yang mills theories, fluid dynamics, all nonlinear theories. There is a, a huge amount of work uh, in classical PDE theory for how to uh, you know, deal with nonlinearities. Uh, there are lots of known. Not everything that we want to know about GR is known, right? Uh, so that, that has to be uh, still uh, improved. Uh, dynamical causality, so that's kind of what Daniele and Klaus were referring to. Uh, the metric in general relativity determines the speed of propagation of small disturbances, but the metric itself is a dynamical variable. So how, to, how do we deal with that? Well, lots is known about this problem as well. Uh, uh, there's a whole class of uh, uh, partial differential equations, uh, uh, systems of partial differential equations that have this property called quasi-linear hyperbolic PDEs. And uh, they include things like gas dynamics and also fluids and other examples like uh, relativistic elasticity. And GR is just another example of one of these um, theories. So since we know how to deal with the, the causal structure of classical theories of this kind, we also know how to deal with the causal structure of GR. And uh, as I mentioned, I have a, I, last year I finished writing a paper about this. Um, there are singularities. Okay, singularities like in the interior of a black hole. Uh, or at the initial moment of a big bang. Uh, <coughs> singularities, again, occur in other field, uh, field theories. Fluid shocks, breaking of waves, focusing of nonlinear wave equations, they're all examples of that. Again, there's a large uh, community of uh, people studying partial differential equations and the properties of these, uh, these kinds of equations. Uh, and there's lots known about uh, that as well. Um, so, What's interesting about these points is that uh, because they're not specific to GR, and GR is just a special example of a certain larger class of theories, any progress that mathematicians make on these theories automatically gives us more tools uh, to work with in, in gravity. Okay? Then there's also the fact that GR is usually described with gauge redundancy. So the fact that we have diffeomorphism variance tells us that we have, we have to eliminate some degrees of freedom. Again. Uh, same is true for other theories that we understand quite well, Maxwell uh, theory, yang mills theory, topological field theories, uh, string theories. And we know quite well how to deal with those. Uh, <coughs> now, this is a, a really uh, big issue that we do not, I do not think we understand quite as well as we would like to. Uh, but still, 
we know something. Uh, the fact that uh, gauge invariant observables uh, that appear in, gravi in gravity generically are not local. Okay? So locality is a very important property in field theory. Uh, and you can keep gravity local uh, if we have a, give it a local formulation. But once you start talking about uh, observables with a nice phenomenological interpretation and they're in actually independent of, of uh, gauge transformations, then you have to uh, face this problem uh, head on. Uh, I have... Uh, so, well, there are some other examples we can uh, um, <coughs> uh, compare with. Uh, in other quantum field theories, like topological field theories, there are also no local observables, and the famous Ahoron of Bohm effect shows that uh, even simple theories like Maxwell electrodynamics, you could have non local uh, observable effects. And uh, in GR, in particular, it has been very difficult to um, isolate a particularly nice set of observables that would generate the algebra of gauge invariant, gauge invariant observables and also have sufficiently nice mathematical properties um, uh, to work well with uh, classical and you know, uh, quantum methods. Uh, but I think that uh, there's some untapped potential to use uh, tools from um, uh, differential geometry where mathematicians have, for about 100 years, since the early work of uh, Elie Cartan, known how to solve the following kind of problem. Given two Riemannian metrics on the manifold, what do you need to do to identify, to, uh, to check whether they are invariant, sorry, to check whether they are the same, uh, belong to the same diffeomorphisms class? Uh, and uh, I'll bring it up a little bit uh, later on. But uh, this uh, a real challenge that has not been completely met, I think. And I think one of the biggest ones that we have to explore. But still, something is known about. Then, you might have noticed, uh, well, comes uh, renormalization. You might have not noticed that these points uh, have to do with, essentially, the classical theory. And if we know how to solve it in the classical theory, uh, we found out that uh, that goes a long way towards solving the same problems in the quantum theory. New problems appear in the quantum theory, on the other hand, and these have to do with uh, renormalization. So there are two kinds of renormalization, I would say. There's UV renormalization, uh, which uh, people first noticed as uh, diverging high momentum integrals in, uh, uh, while evaluating Fermi diagrams. And these appear, again, not uniquely in GR, but uh, essentially all interacting quantum field theories, and we know how to deal with them. Okay? There's also infrared, or IR, renormalization, which uh, sh shows up, for example, as uh, infrared divergent momentum integrals in some kind of scattering events in quantum field theory. And again, these all appear with, uh, in, in, uh, these appear in essentially all theories with massless fields and spatially non-compact uh, space-time topologies. And again, there's quite a lot known about this. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> and the last point is what I already brought up before, non-perturbative definition. Again, this is not unique to GR. And uh, you know, the fields of the standard model uh, also lack a non-perturbative definition. And this is, uh, after point uh, number five about observables, this is the, um, well, actually, I would say this is the biggest unsolved problem, and this will probably be the next biggest one. Um, okay, now uh, I'm going to, sorry, just a second. Uh, so next slide, I'm going to state my philosophical position on, uh, well, uh, what the physical theory should be, and I'm going to claim that once, if this construction is carried out, then essentially we'll have a theory that satisfies all, essentially all we could reasonably want from a theory, physical theory of quantum gravity. Um, and then I'll discuss some uh, uh, perceived problems. Uh, and after that, I can quickly, just to show you that uh, I have something to back up these claims about that, the fact that we know a lot about these, these issues, I'll give you some references about I don't know, where these are, they're discussed. So you had a question? Yeah. Which is mainly the example that you are looking at. We use the legal language to do some kind of field theory. Yeah. And I think you know there's this idea that we don't know how to apply the legal language to do for gravity. That's false. No, well, that's false. So this comes under this point. Uh, sorry, you been essentially. And it has essentially been solved. Yeah. Okay.
I'm I'm not sure that's that's true. I mean, you well, it's it's a so it's a claim to be checked. I mean, you there's a machinery to do calculations. You plug in the Einstein Hilbert action, and then you find uh, that uh, well uh, that you have um, well something that comes out. If you if you change the action, you add another term. You some sorry. Yeah. Okay, I, I would say that um, this, uh, the, the black hole question belongs more in the question of singularities, okay? And I don't think it's as simple as that. I mean, there are heuristic arguments, but I don't think that they're sound. So about how black holes would influence uh, ultraviolet behavior. Okay, because the, the ultraviolet behavior in the, uh, the form of regression theory, which is a thing we understand because this, this problem hasn't been solved, it's, uh, it's, it's a solved problem. And the UV effects are separated from everything else. Okay, yeah, sure. All right, so here's my philosophy slide. <laughs> um, all right, what is a physical theory? Uh, I, I would say it's a highly efficient method of summarizing past empirical data and predicting future empirical data. Okay, with, and uh, I'll say also with quantifiable uncertainty because you know, any one particular experiment could give uh, a probability distribution rather than a value. Uh, there's some code words in here, so by empirical data I mean outcomes of controlled experiments. Um, and by summarize, uh, well, that could mean many different things, but uh, historically we found that that can be done very, uh, very efficiently by p essentially choosing a Lagrangian with a field content and uh, particular interactions. Uh, a controlled experiment, in it has these two words, controlled and experiment. By controlled, I mean um, well, a particular preparation of experiments, so this will be uh, summarized in a state, so that's a mathematical interpretation, and the uh, particular experiment will correspond to an observable in a theory which will belong to the algebra of observables. And prediction would be basically a pairing between the states and observables which will give us numbers. Uh, I would say that, you know, th this is a physical theory. There is no a priori reason why this theory would necessarily be simple or beautiful if it faithfully models the world that we live in. Okay? I'm sure the world does not care about our notions of beauty of simplicity, uh, but uh, I think that we care very much about what the world looks like and often we adapt our notions of simplicity and beauty to basically agree with the, the best model of the world we have. So you had a question? Where? Well, okay, I uh, don't have a source for it. So this is my personal synthesis of what, you know, basically I've observed people doing in the history of science, and uh, so that's, that's what I think is a satisfactory physical theory. Okay, um, now, often in theoretical circles, one hears a statement like, oh, this theory has a problem, or this problem, or it has that problem. What is a problem for a theory? I think there are basically two kinds of problems. So there are internal problems. Uh, theory is uh, inconsistent, but I mean a very, very strong notion of consistency here. Like, you know, you could prove A, some statement A to be both true and false. That's inconsistent, okay? Which is different from what uh, some theoretical physicists uh, um, mean by consistency, because sometimes, or rather often for them, it's failure of a favorite uh, method uh, or uh, uh, calculation or approximation method applied to a particular theory. That uh, I would not call consistency. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, there's a, it's a, a quite, um, I think, agreed on meaning uh, what that means in colloquial and both uh, technical language. And uh, that's, that's something different. Um, and also, there's failure of producing unambiguous predictions. I mean, if uh, you, know, you define all these things, uh, with states and observables and the dynamics are given or the summary given by Lagrangian, but you still cannot construct the pairing that uh, pairs states and observables and gives numbers, I would say that's a failure of unambiguous predictions. Okay? Sadly, uh, the, uh, the you know, quantum, field, quantum field theories that we work with actually do have this problem precisely because they are perturbative and produce formal power series rather than actual numbers. Okay? But that you know, still remains a 
like I already admitted, a, a problem to be solved. Uh, there also could be external problems, which uh, uh, if we had unambiguous predictions uh, of um, uh, some controlled experiments, and they did not match empirical data, then we would know that this theory is wrong. Okay, and then we have to look for a better one. So these are the kind of problems that I think are uh, real and have to be solved, have to be addressed. On the other hand, there are many things that are claimed to be problems that I disagree with. Okay? I, I don't think that if uh, a, th a theory fails to account for some coincidences, like say there are two particles and they happen to have the same mass, uh, and the masses are free parameters in your theory, there's no reason to demand that the theory must tell you why they are the same. It could be coincidence. Free parameter is a free parameter. Um, again, uh, the, the, if, if the particular theory has a well-defined formulation, but it seems to be intractable by a given approximation formalism, that is not a problem of the theory. That is a problem of whatever approximation of formalism is trying to be uh, applied to. Uh, theoretical prejudice, aesthetics, are also not real problems. So with that, let me go to uh, a, a incomplete, probably, list of things that uh, are often considered as problems of quantum gravity, of uh, the standard approach that I outlined. And um, here are my counter arguments showing that you know, these, these particular problems uh, don't fall into one of these categories and at best fall into one of these. And uh, I don't claim to uh, originate any of these counter arguments. I'm sure if you thought uh, hard enough about any one of these problems, you've seen them before. Um, if you wish, you can just use my talk as a data point uh, that there are practicing physicists who hold some of these opinions. OK, so let me briefly run through them. So there's the problem of timelessness. I think that, so Klaus mentioned, I think Karima is going to talk about that. Uh, I think that uh, this is a, f a failure or a defect of the 3 plus 1 canonical formalism. So it makes things appear like there's no evolution. Uh, but if you use a different formalism, like a variant one, that goes away. And the formalism is equivalent to the canonical formalism. I know, and that's... Problem. No, but that's why I think... All right, okay. No. Okay, but well, one often hears the phrase problem of time, right? Okay. So I disagree with that statement. I mean, sorry, that phrasing. So I, okay. maybe we have the same opinion, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. But so, uh, I mean, I might be I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing against, against your position. So I'm arguing a position uh, where uh, the you know people state that there's such a thing called the problem of time, uh, and I would say it's not a problem because, as you say, the three plus one and the uh, co covariant formals are equivalent. And if it's not a problem in covariant formalism, it's not a problem in three plus one either. Okay, that's that's my argument. Um, and if one talks about the subjective experience of passage of time, that is very well modeled by introducing uh, clock observables into your theory. Uh, this probably might be the most controversial. Um, and, sorry. Uh, statistical mechanics of thermodynamics of what? Yeah, for example, of uh, quantum gravity is equivalent. So, for example, we cannot reconcile easily our understanding of thermodynamics in terms of uh, the thermodynamic of time with the quantum gravity formula. I so don't think there's a problem there. Well, I, I, I certainly would agree that there are lots of technical problems, but I don't see a conceptual one. I mean, if you want to, okay, at the classical level, if you want to have a uh, statistical uh, theory, including gravity, and you construct a classical phase space and you put a probability distribution on it, that's, that's your statistical mechanics. If you want to do it in a quantum theory, you construct a quantum algebra of observables, and then you uh, uh, have a you know, mixed state on that. 
I don't, I don't see how there's a, there's a particular problem there. I mean, it's technically difficult, certainly, but yeah. okay. Um, right. The issue of uh, non-renormalizability has already come up um, while discussing effective field theories, and might come up again. So, uh, my the point I want to make, uh, and it's related to your question about UV uh, uh, renormalization, I think is that uh, there's a notion of renormalizability that uh, uh, was formulated by Dyson uh, or, or around that time. Uh, essentially, it's a power counting renormalizability, which uh, restricts the terms that you can have in your Lagrangian so that their uh, coefficients uh, are at most dimensionless, do not, cannot have inverse uh, powers of, uh, of uh, lengths uh, as dimension. Uh, but that is an outdated, um, notion of, of what a theory needs to satisfy to be renormalizable. Um, so the, the notion of non-renormalizable, which negates this power counting renormalizability, is also outdated. Uh, I on this issue, I'd like to quote Steven Weinberg, um, who uh, says from time to time that non-renormalizable theories are just as renormalizable as non-renormalizable ones, uh, where he uses the word non-renormalizable non in two different ways. First, in this way, and second, in a more modern way. So he would claim that he's talking about effective field theory. And I would say that uh, there's basically, there are theorems uh, about renormalization that uh, take this form. Basically, the input is uh, a Lagrangian and something called a renormalization scheme, and outcome all possible endpoint functions. Okay. Uh, no cutoff anywhere. I mean, the uh, renormalization scheme might include uh, introducing. Uh, a regulator, and um, but to complete it, you need to remove it. So th this includes both of these steps. Now, <clears throat> the 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 modern statement of this uh, uh, of uh, the renormalization program is that there always exists a renormalization scheme. I mean, uh, there are some technical issues, but they actually are not an obstacle in applying this to gravity uh, or a very large class of theories. And if uh, one changes the renormalization scheme, then this change can be absorbed in the change of the initial Lagrangian that we started with, which is already something that needs to be constrained by experiment. Okay? Um, I think that this, since this might be controversial, you might have some questions about it, but in that case, I urge you to keep them for the discussion because otherwise <laughs> we'll get stuck here. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, all this statement about the renormalization is, is perturbative and we don't have a non-perturbative uh, st uh, statement simply because we don't have a non-perturbative uh, formulation of, of, of the quantum field theory. Um, very quickly now, this uh, black hole evaporation, which is often claimed to be a challenge to be resolved. Uh, I say there's no particular uh, contradiction to be resolved here because uh, the horizon of a black hole is very much like an open window in a room. Uh, and if you neglect the outside of a room, you do not expect the theory describing it to be unitary. And same thing if you neglect the interior of a black hole, you do not expect your evolution to be unitary. Uh, and th this is, uh, I think, unambiguous at short to intermediate times. At long times, where the structure of the singularity really becomes important, I think the answer is simply unknown. So the conjecture that at long times the unitarity is violated uh, in some particular way, I think are premature. One, we must wait until we have better control of a long time uh, behavior of the theory before making any claims there. There are also uh, questions of naturalness. For example, uh, well, if you just look at gravity alone, uh, people are, some people are unhappy with the smallness of the cosmological constant, but uh, it's just a free parameter in theory. There's no particular uh, reason to, for it to have any value other than what we measured by experiment. And uh, there's also been a program in theoretical physics to try to unify all forces, including gravity. And by unification here, I mean something very specific, is to construct a Yang-Mills type theory with a large enough gauge group, which somehow gets uh, broken down to a smaller gauge group, and then all the fields, including gravitational fields, fall out. And I think this is aesthetic or theoretical prejudice, and it's not a problem that necessarily needs to be solved. So uh, the construction that I outlined does not address unification, and I think that's perfectly acceptable. OK, so I only have a few minutes left. And basically, what uh, I'll do is uh, flash extremely quickly 
uh, a few literature references, which I can share with you later, um, uh, if, if you're interested, uh, about uh, not, not all of them, but uh, uh, most of the issues that, are, that I uh, claim are real challenges for the uh, quantization of gravity. So the construction of the, uh, uh, the classical phase space, um, this is the reason why, well, it's often claimed, the reason why we need to do a 3 plus 1 type decomposition, because it's the best way we know how to do that. And I don't think that's actually true. And uh, you can read my very long paper on the subject, <laughs> uh, or parts of it, at least, uh, which uh, discusses uh, how to construct the uh, symplectic and Poisson brackets uh, directly from the Lagrangian. Uh, then there's uh, the issue of how to uh, make sure that when we uh, quantize a the theory of gauge invariance, uh, uh, we can eliminate the gauge invariance in the quantum theory. So essentially, there's a result uh, which claims that if you take a field theory with gauge invariance, and then you take away the gauge invariance and you quantize, or you first quantize and take away the gauge invariance, that you get the same theory. And this is the theorem, okay, uh, which uses two uh, basic tools. It uses the so-called BVBRST or Battalion Vinkovsky Becker West Stora Tutin uh, treatment of gauge theories and deformation quantization. So if you put these two together, you can actually have a theorem about uh, the commutation of these two pro processes. For GR. For GR, yes. Oh, really? So there are possible obstructions yeah. are called anomalies or gauge anomalies, and it's known that in GR they're absent. This is a Gillen Steinberg conjecture. It's, it's, you'd say it's, yeah. it's, there's a theorem that. Yeah, so. For gravity. Yeah. That's your conjecture. Yes. So uh, it's formal, so all, everything is formal in H bar, but there's a theorem that says that gauge anomalies are absent in 4D GR. Yes, totally. I agree. Okay, so uh, there's a classic book by Hino and Teitelbaum, and there's a recent thesis by Katarzyna Reisner from Hamburg, who uh, wrote it under the direction of Klaus Fredenhagen, which summarizes a lot of this uh, in very nice uh, formalism and detail. Then there's the issue of observables. Um, uh, okay, I can't say much about that because I'm running out of time. I just want to point out that, so I actually wrote a paper that uh, takes a very simple example and uh, works it out. Uh, using a particular non-local uh, observable uh, with a uh, clear phenomenological interpretation uh, in linearized quantum gravity. So this is the simplest case I could take because it was already sufficiently complicated. And for anyone interested in the problem of observables, I recommend reading um, Richard Woodard's PhD thesis from, from Harvard from 1984. Unfortunately, uh, it's uh, very hard to come by, so you can either order the... Uh, microfiche version of it from the Harvard Library, or you can look at my hard drive <laughs> if you're interested. Um, then, again, uh, there's the deformation quanti quantization procedure, which is a formalization of what is actu actually happens in practice when people do, when physicists do quantization. And it is, uh, together with BVABRST, the other piece of the puzzle uh, in the theorem about the commutation of quantization and reduction. Um, for example, here's a cle very clear paper that started um, de essentially, well, not started, but was very influential in the application of differential quantization to quantum field theory. Uh, and uh, there are people working hard on, uh, um, well, exploring that idea uh, so that uh, the uh, quantization, um, which usually is perturbative in two parameters, which is h bar and your whatever your nonlinear coupling constants, uh, to solve the uh, nonlinear problem classically, so eliminate form formal perturbation theory in the coupling constant, and then have only formal perturbation in h bar. So it doesn't quite get all the way to non perturbative definition, but gets you sort of halfway there. Um, the UV renormization, uh, the, the basic keyword, uh, keyword you need to know uh, is Epstein Glaser renormization. Um, it's an outgrowth of work uh, of, from the 50s of Bogolubov, Stuckelberg, and, and others. And their work was done in the uh, early 70s and has since then been perfected uh, and improved um, to, be, to work in curved space time. And it essentially says that you can re renormalize basically any uh, Lagrangian, as long, well, of course, in formal perturbation theory, uh, as long as it uh, does not have gauge anomalies. And uh, again, you can read uh, in these references for a very nice summary some of these results. Um, infrared renormalization is um, not quite, well, there's a lot known, uh, like I said, about uh, how to compute scattering cross-sections in th uh, theories with massless particles. Um, 
Unfortunately, not, it, it has not been uh, imported in as fine grained detail into the uh, algebraic formulation of, of uh, quantum field theory, where um, uh, the UV randomization already has. Uh, so this, there is still some work to be done here, but essentially the basic physical ideas are there. Um, Non-perturbative definition, well, I basically already said a lot about that. Uh, let me conclude now by basically saying that uh, I think that the problem of quantum gravity can be rather conservatively and precisely stated, and it turns into a technical mathematical challenge. Okay? There exists already a solution. It's a limited one. It's limited to formal perturbation theory, but then again, so is our best formulation of the standard model, unfortunately. Um, and the solution does not introduce new fields, new degrees of freedom, does not introduce n new dimensions, four dimensions are enough, does not uh, necessarily use any radically new dynamics, the Einstein-Hilbert action is fine, and it doesn't uh, require discretization, so it still can be formulated on a continuum manifold. Um, and what's great about uh, noticing all this is that, um, especially making that list of challenges that I, I showed you at the beginning, is that there are many different uh, uh, fields of mathematics that are involved and there are many people actively working on each one of them. And any progress that they make, for example, in EPD theory or some algebraic methods related to deformation quantization, can be imported into our toolbox to deal with quantum gravity. So, you know, whoever is interested in working this approach, they're not working in isolation. They are working together with a larger community, even though the connections are not always realized. And uh, with that, you know, formulation, uh, so if, if, you are, if you are aware of the formulation, what is left to be done? Well, there are actually, even if the theory is well-defined, um, there are, well, once the theory is well-defined, there are many physical uh, implications left to be explored. And, uh, well, so that's what I would encourage everyone interested to do. <laughs>